But how could we convince them that a little later, when there is not any longer an embryo, but a tiny fetus at two months of age, at the moment that it is killed by abortion, how can we convince them that it is really a member of our species? <coughs> it's difficult to convince men. But an interesting phenomenon is that you can convince easily other bipeds than humans, or because they are convinced by nature itself. Those bipeds I'm thinking of are living on the other part of the Earth in Australia. They are as big as we are. They are walking on their hind legs like we do. They have a big tail, and they, we call them kangaroos. Kangaroos are very interesting animals because the female has a very tiny uterus and she is obliged to have a miscarriage at around two months. At the moment, the kangaroo is the size of my thumb, while the size a baby is at the moment of ordinary abortion. Now, this little kangaroo, when it is expelled from the extremely tiny uterus, does not look at all like a kangaroo. It looks like a little sausage. The, egg, the, the legs are very small, and the hind legs are very tiny, and he has only rudimentary anterior legs with one tiny claw on it. And this little sausage really <laughs> does not look like a kangaroo. Now, it has an extraordinary property already developed that he feels gravity. So that mother kangaroos sit down at the moment of the expulsion, and when the baby is out, he climbs in the fur against gravity. And then by necessity, he comes to the pouch, fall inside, then he takes a tiny nipple inside the orbicular muscle of his mouth, and he stay there for another seven months because, because the big kangaroo needs nine months to be developed like we do inside the womb. Now, the miraculous fact is that this tiny little thing <coughs> is the only living system that mother kangaroo would allow going inside the pouch. She would not allow a mice to do that. Now, we are obliged to believe that nature has, so to speak, wired in the meager brain of Mother Kangaroo some system which allows her to recognize, if I can say so, the kangarooiness <laughs> of this little sausage. Yeah. Now, if nature has taken the trouble to give that extraordinary intelligence built in into the small brain of a mother kangaroo, I cannot believe it has not given to the one liter and a half brain of a normal geneticist, it has not built in the possibility of recognizing that early members of our kin are just tiny human beings. About animals, what is interesting is that they can teach us a lot about human nature. I was talking about the chimpanzees. I like very much chimpanzees, and I have got a very nice experience with them. <coughs> now, chimpanzees are nevertheless intelligence like dog, not much more than dogs. But even the most gifted chimpanzee, the best trained one, will never understand when he mounts his female that nine months later, eventually, a tiny chimpanzee will come out who looks like him. That he will never conceive. And the curious phenomenon is that 
man has always known this relationship between copulation and population, between love and child. And it is so true that the pagans, when they wanted to represent the, the passion of love, they were not representing uh, a coital uh, scene like you can see now on television sometime, but they were just painting or uh, making the figure of a tiny little one, Eros is a baby, Cupidon is a baby, the god of love is a little child. And it was not necessary to show anything else than a child to demonstrate the little god of love. Now, this is extremely interesting because it shows that man has always known this relationship between love and child. And it's what gives to man a very peculiar dignity to his conduct about sexual matter, is that he knows what is eventually the coming out of the sexual intercourse. That's the reason why I think that if we accept, and there are reasons to accept that, that monogamy is the best fitting system for human population. Well, it can be demonstrated statistically, demographically, and uh, psychologically. Uh, if we consider also that marriage, it's a kind of prerogative given to the husband to be the only one allowed to this extraordinary deposit of sexual cells inside this sanctuary which is the feminine body. Then if we just observe those two phenomena, then it comes out that abstinence, if no, ma no marriage is engaged, our periodic continence in the happy marriage are just normal use of our consciousness about what is really the effect of love. Then, without uh, going too much in details, I would state that contraception, which is making love without making the baby. In vitro fertilization, which is making the baby without making love. Abortion, which is unmaking the baby. And pornography and promiscuity, which are unmaking the love, are contrary to human dignity. They are possibly not contrary to animal dignity, but it happens that we know more than the most clever chimpanzee will never know. Now, people will tell you, and it's a great fashion nowadays, that with all those tricks, like IUD, like uh, some pills, uh, any tricks of that kind, we have definitely separated love from procreation. I would say recreation from procreation. And they are very proud of that definition. And they said it's a novelty. It's very interesting for the biologist because it's a regression of roughly 300,000 years. This trick has been already played by nature to separate volupte from reproduction. That's happened among ants. Ants are exceedingly interesting animals. Uh, they are produced to be sterile. And the only slave 
of reproduction, the only slave is called the queen. All the others are liberated. They are just walking the whole day. They have no children. But they have the greatest volupty, which is by titillation of the antennas, they are regurgitating a little drop of dew that they are taken from some plant. And the bewildering phenomenon is that the aunt, which has got that uh, foraging around, cannot use it herself. There is a special valvules which pre prevent her to regurgitate for going in her own stomach. But she can regurgitate to go in the stomach of the other. So that, and that was marvelously described by a poet, Metterling. Metterling is a great poet, as you probably know. And he wrote admirably that what was the cement of this society is a continuous exchange by titillation of the antenna and regurgitation of voluptuous prestation between sterile female. And it's interesting, really, to recognize that, because nature is a good teacher, that what is presented today as a top performance of technicality has been used among social insects and has been considered by nature to be good for insects, but not for higher form of life. Maybe we should sometime be listening to the counsel of modern nature.